and you're fine with this being recorded and uh, put online? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's Yemina. We have Xushan Lu talking about surface geometry inversion of geophysical electromagnetic data. Um, before we get to Xushan's uh, presentation, a few um, bits of information. You can find all the previous and upcoming Eminars on the Emina page. So if, if you have signed up through some other means, um, you can find uh, on MTNet a list of the previous two seasons. We're now in our third season and the upcoming seminars for season three. There you can also find YouTube links and presentations for those uh, people who have um, allowed us to put those things online. And I think that's a really valuable resource. Uh, you will see there's a wide array of topics being covered. Um, we still mention this every time, although everybody is uh, Zoom and webinar professional by now, I'm sure the main thing to consider is that we're in a webinar, which is a bit different from a um, Zoom meeting. And we ask you to put all the questions that you have in the Q and A um, category. This works like the chat, but is a slightly different um, yeah, category. And that allows us to keep track of those questions and make sure all of them get answered. Typically, we've had it every time that the questions are raised at the end. Um, I will read them out so they're in the, the record for YouTube and then uh, Xushan will um, answer them. If there's something that you really want to ask uh, in the middle of the talk, just write your questions. I will try to monitor this and if there's anything, um, interrupt quick, briefly and we can discuss this. Um, next week we have uh, an amina by ping zhang on crosswell electromagnetic te technologies for reservoir monitoring imaging and characterization uh, and then we'll go into our year end break as far as i know at the moment there is nothing scheduled for the 14th or the 21th and we will commence again in january so yeah as i said in the beginning today we have xuzhan lu on uh, surface geometry inversion and geophysical electrom of geophysical electromagnetic data. And Xushan did uh, his bachelor and master's degree in, in China at, I can't, probably don't pronounce this horribly, Xiangnan University, uh, and then came to Canada in 2015 to do his PhD with Colin Farquharson at a Memorial University and worked on uh, finite volume and finite element modeling codes. Uh, and after his PhD in 2020, he is uh, a postdoc at Memorial and Mount Allison University, working with still Colin, I think, and, and Peter Lelieve, uh, and talking uh, and developing minimum structure inversion algorithms and uh, yeah, different ways of thinking about the inverse problem. And he will talk about some of that today. Uh, and with that, I will stop sharing.
and we'll hand over to you. All right, thanks, Max. Um, I'm going to start my sharing now. Um, do you see everything all right? I see. Now I see the full screen. Yeah, this looks good. OK, OK. All right, OK, I guess I can start. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming to this talk. And thanks, Max, and also Alan, for organizing this. This is a, a, a surely a great opportunity for me to present uh, my research. And today I will present uh, our research on surface geometry inversion of geophysical EM data. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, so we're just get things ready. All right, uh, first I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors, Chris Gaddy. Uh, he's the, um, uh, he used to be a PhD in the R group and he did a lot of uh, uh, surface geometry inversion on potential data sets. And uh, he helped me to uh, de develop uh, this uh, surface geometry inversion for EM as well. And Colin uh, Fockerson and Peter Lilly, uh, they are my supervisors, and uh, they are the most minds behind this algorithm. Um, so uh, this is the outline of this uh, talk. And first, I will go through the motivations. Why do we want to do a surface geometry inversion? And, 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 and then I will move to the details of the surface geometry inversion. And then I will show you two examples. The first example is a synthetic marine CSC EM example. And then the second example is a real data TM uh, uh, example from a mining uh, project in Canada. And then I'll conclude. Um, so first, the implementations. So we know that geologic models are complex, just like this picture shown here. In, um, so we have uh, a lot of different geological units. They are unique. And the, the geometrical relationship between each other can be considered as very complex, as shown in this uh, picture. And we also have topography. But as a geophysicist, uh, uh, sometimes we find ourselves uh, ourselves only need to be concerned with the localized ore bodies uh, because uh, that's where it has the uh, physical uh, property contrast and the best our interest basically. And we can see sometimes the ore body like the picture shown here. Uh, so uh, this is the oil massive sulfide ore deposit from Northern Labrador in Canada. So sometimes we can find that they have a blocky type of shape. So it's just a, like a blob. Uh, um, uh, and even for this simple uh, old body, we can see still uh, in real life, they have really complex geometric uh, shapes. Um, um, but sometimes we find that, okay, there are other types of anomalies like the graffiti fault uh, model shown here. So we, we can see that this fault, these are just very thin structures, obviously, and they are plate-like. But some of the simple ones, they are just exactly like a plate, like the one shown here, but some of them are still probably bending in all directions, not only vertically, but also horizontally. Um, so as geophysicists, our, one of our tasks is just to model the geophysical signatures of all these different types of uh, anomalies. Uh, and then to do the modeling, we need to uh, build a geophysical models starting from geological models. Uh, the geological models are normally uh, represented by wireframes like the picture shown here. And by geophysical model, what I mean is that we probably need to discretize the subsurface domain into small cells. You can do discretize things either using structured rectilinear mesh, or you can discretize it using astructured hydro mesh. And then we fill in each of the mesh cells uh, using, uh, we fill in each of the mesh cells with a unique physical property value. And in these two pictures, we are just using different colors to represent different physical property values. Um, so in our research group, we prefer this unstructured geological mesh discretization just because it's more flexible to work with the complex geological models like the one shown here. Um, and, and one of the difficult tasks of doing this kind of you know, modeling that you need to uh, create a quality meshes, quality unstructured geological meshes. And I think this is still some, uh, some topic that is uh, actually researched by uh, all the researchers. And we can see people are trying to develop new methods um, to generate uh, quality matches from uh, geof uh, sorry, geological models. And in our research group, we also have developed uh, uh, our own tool. Uh, actually, Peter developed this uh, a nice uh, open source Java package called Fast Modeler. And with this Fast Modeler software, we can manually build a complex geological model, and then we can turn that into uh, a quality mesh, quality structure to the mesh with the help by TechGen library. Um, so uh, over the years, we have developed uh, different types of numerical methods just for, for the modeling. We have finite element code, finite volume, minimally finite difference, and the mesh-free methods. 
Except for this mesh three, all these methods they work with unstructured territorial meshes. And we have applied these different numerical methods to the modeling problems of uh, potential data sets, uh, different EM data sets, and also seismic data sets. But when we do the modeling, it's an assumption that we have already known sufficient information about the geology so we can build the models. But that's not always the case. As we know, sometimes we just don't have enough uh, uh, geological information. So we have to rely on our geological, so geophysical data sets, and we do immersions to try to construct a model that help us understand the geology. And I think it's fair to see that the uh, Occam style minimum structure inversion is probably just the most widely used inversion method. Um, you can do the inversion uh, uh, for what individual data set like the seismic travel time. So this is the inversion result. And you can also jointly invert different types of data sets uh, get to get a, a better image. But what, no matter what you do, as long as you are using minimum structure inversion, I think you are guaranteed to find your constructing models to be very smooth, like the, those pictures shown here. Um, with these smooth models, it's actually pretty difficult to tell where is exactly the boundary of these anomalies. And sometimes we know that uh, for certain projects or for, or for certain uh, problems, we really need to know where are the boundaries, not only to know there is an anomaly. But the reason why we are always getting this smooth model uh, is that because we, the way that we do our inversion, because we uh, have two different terms in our objective function that we minimize in, during the inversion. And the one term is the model structure term, which is just quantifies this model smoothness using this L2 norm. And uh, because we explicitly ask this term to be minimized, then of course you are getting something very smooth. Um, so this can be problematic, obviously, for certain uh, for certain uh, scenarios, like the one here, the work carried out by Yang et al. They have inverted the different EM data sets, airborne different uh, and the surface and the bulk of data sets, and they, they have uh, obtained these images. And uh, we can see um, these images. These are all very smooth, and uh, it becomes problematic for this specific type of uh, ore deposit. This is the linear deposit. Uh, which is the VMS deposit. So it has a very thin and click-like structure. And so there are two problems with this. So first of all, so the, the smooth model, not, not, uh, not only in this picture, but in all these pictures, they, doesn't, they, they don't really necessarily indicate uh, the, the, the true shape of the anomaly, which is a thin and uh, click-like. And, and also there always seems to be an offset between the ore body and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, recovered model here in this immersion images. And this can be particularly um, uh, problematic when your structure is not only thin, but it's deep and steeply. And the reason is because we, once we, we, we do the, um, once we carry out of the geophysical survey, we need to uh, pick up, pick the location of the true, uh, of the, uh, like for this example, pick the location of the graphic fault, and then we need to drill it to verify what's there. And because the structure is very steeply deep in, so you don't want to drill like a perpendicular, entirely perpendicular to this structure, because that's just too long and that costs money. But when you drill holes, we will drill drill holes like these two, and then if you only, even if you only miss the target by 50 meters uh, horizontally, then you're guaranteed to miss this target here. And that's also based on money uh, for sure. So then if you just carry out one inversion, the minimum structure inversion, so this picture on the right, it probably shows what you will get. And this is just a, a smooth model with a size that is much larger than the true anomaly. And then with these kind of mo uh, models, uh, with these kind of images, it's, then you, it's really difficult to target your drill holes. Um, and it's kind of surprising, at least to me, uh, um, when I look into the literature, I find that these thin uh, structures, steeply, uh, steeply deep in structures, they are not the minority. So there are many ore deposits just having exactly the shape like that. So on these two pictures on the left, this is a, a nickel sulfur deposit in China. And this on the right, this is a, a VMS type deposit in Newfoundland in Canada. So when we have uh, geological models like that, we need, to deal, we need to deal with them. We need to come up with uh, better solutions. 
Um, so in the past, people have certainly realized that this is a, a problem for uh, minimum structure inversion uh, because you don't really get a sharp boundary. Uh, so people have come up with different solutions, for example, the work by Liu et al. So they have tried uh, not only air 2 norm, but also air one norm, and also they have tried a wavelet-based method. So I think you can see, yeah, with all these different methods compared with this air 2 norm, minimum structure inversion, you are kind of getting a better image with a sharper boundary, I guess. But still, these, all these images are kind of small and they are not necessarily a good representations of the true model here. And also people have tried to use classroom methods. Uh, for example, the work by Jadashun uh, et al. They have used these classroom methods and they eventually managed to get a model like this. So with different geological units and with clear boundaries. And this model actually uh, represents the, or resembles the true geology very well. But we all know that for classroom methods to work uh, properly, we also we really need to know the number of clusters correctly. And also we need to know the location of the clusters correctly. And also people try to use level set inversion. And we can see this is example, synthetic example of uh, inverting a seismic travel time and data um, uh, in 2D. And uh, on the right, this is the inversion result of the minimum structure uh, type of inversion. And on the left, this is the level set inversion. You can see it's certainly helping uh, to get a better uh, image here. So there are techniques, other techniques like this to help. But here we are trying to uh, develop a, a method called surface geometry inversion method. And uh, we know in the conventional uh, minimum structure inversion method, like I mentioned before, we are essentially using our algorithm to fill in each of the cells with a, a physical property value. And once you uh, finish your inversion, you get an image like this, and you ask yourself, okay, where are the boundaries? Then normally you will say, okay, just look for the places where it has the largest gradient in the physical property. Then this would probably be your guess of the boundary information, but you know it's not necessarily good guess, uh, and this is probably different from the true uh, location there. Um, so we are trying to solve this problem by using a, a method called surface geometry inversion. Um, and if we know we have a ore deposit like this, then we would go ahead and build a model like this. And then what we do instead of inverting for physical properties, we would just invert directly the nodal coordinates of these models. And then you would say, okay, yeah, you need to know uh, uh, certainly prior information about your local geology. And also you need to know basic type uh, uh, and the shape of the anomaly. And also because most of the times we would fix the physical property inside this ore deposit, that requires you to have a good estimation of typical physical property values. Um, um, and not only for the uh, ore body, but also for the background. Uh, so I, I guess, you know, this is, uh, 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 I think it's fair to see this method is uh, not something that can be used to solve all the problems. So I, in my opinion, this method would be something good to be used in later stage interpretation. Um, so I, I like to acknowledge that uh, the surface geometry inversion method where we try to directly, directly work for geometry parameters is not a new method. And uh, this is just one of the parametric inversion method. Uh, I think there have been other researches uh, uh, in the literature where people try this discrete, uh, for example, the discrete body inversion. And also people try to, um, to directly work for the interfaces of the basement uh, layers. And also uh, for not only for uh, potential data, also for EM data. Um, next, let's take a look at what we do exactly and in, uh, in detail for the surface geometry inversion. So as I mentioned before, we are no longer filling in the cells of a pre discretized mesh with the physical property values in our algorithm. Instead, we are directly inverting for uh, the nodal coordinates and uh, to get the uh, uh, geometrical parameters there in our inversion. So uh, to, uh, to invert for, uh, um, to start the surface geometry inversion for a model like this. So there are several steps that we need to prepare. First is that we need to prepare the uh, uh, observed data. So you need to have the observed data to carry out your inversion for sure. And then uh, you need to establish this support topological role for different types of all bodies. So for example, uh, this is the blocky type uh, of all bodies. So the topological rule basically means that uh, um, the connections of the different nodes, we know that we, uh, we, we, uh, we use a model like this to represent the, the body. So by inserting a, a small number of nodes and then we connect these nodes into facets 
And these facets are essentially used to represent the, um, uh, the wireframes of the boundary of this anomaly. And then these connections, which is referred to as topological rules, they are fixed during the inversion. So this is our way of parameterizing this type of blocky type of uh, uh, anomalies. So we call it block parameterization. But we know that there are, as I mentioned before, there are other structures like the thin uh, graphitic fault model here. And if we blindly use the previous, um, if we blindly use the previous uh, parameterization method, then this can cause problems. So we come up with a new uh, parameterization uh, uh, method where we uh, just use a single surface, which is made of a bunch of nodes, and we connect these nodes into triangles. And then we just parameterize this thin structure using this surface. And when we want to calculate the further modeling responses, we need to reconstruct this thin block there. So still, this is needed, but this is our inversion parameterization. So what we do is that we duplicate this surface and move the original and duplicate surface a bit away from each other, and then we sew them together to uh, to to uh, to to get this uh, thin plate uh, um, anomaly there. Uh, so then we can use it to calculate our further modeling responses. <clears throat> and then, okay, so you, when you establish these topological rules or you build an input model, you really need to have a good estimation of your model. So there are a few methods that you can use to, uh, to estimate your model. Uh, sorry. So when you have some basic understanding of the geology and you have your geophysical data set, then you can carry out a, for, uh, a try and error for modeling. So once you build a model, and then this, if this model is able to meet uh, to to match the data to a certain extent, you can say, okay, I'm confident enough that the model that I have built here is probably very close already to the true model. Then you can start building your uh, your uh, input model based on this model. Or if you don't have enough uh, geologic information there, so you can always ca uh, carry out a, a voxel inversion and to get an image like this one. And then you can build the models using uh, the image as, as shown here. Um, or if you're lucky enough that, okay, you have already had, had a few drill holes, then you can just start building your model based on these drill holes there. Um, so this is how we can uh, estimate our models. And then once we build our model, input model, we have the initial solution there. Uh, uh, sorry, we can just start to calculate our initial solution there. Um, but one thing we need also to, to, uh, to care about is how to apply bounds to the model parameters. So the bounds is just essentially a search volume uh, with the image you allow these nodes to move because essentially in our immersion, this is um, what changes. So, but you don't want them to be moving freely all over the place. You want to uh, apply a bounds. Essentially, this, is, uh, this bounds is, can be considered as a priors. So for example, for, for a plate model like this, normally you would have some surface EM data and then from the data, you have a better understanding of the top nodes. You probably know where should be your uh, the top part of the plate, but you don't really have much knowledge about the bottom part. So uh, what you do is that, okay, you can apply a smaller search volume as indicated by these colors for different nodes. So these nodes can be allowed to be moved in a smaller range, but for these nodes, okay, you can allow them to move freely in a large, much larger range. Um, so the next part is the optimization part. So we decided to use uh, G algorithm to uh, solve this optimization problem. This is because in our surface geometry inversion, we no longer have this uh, uh, model uh, 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 smoothness term anymore. So we don't need, we, we don't have a regularization anymore. So this gives us a problem that is overdetermined. Uh, why? Because normally the number of parameters in our inversion is pretty small. For this example, we only have 24 amount of parameters, but we can have 400 data points. So this gives us an overdetermined problem. And for the conventional minimum structure inversion, obviously this is underdetermined. So this turns out to be something uh, difficult to solve and we have to rely on a global optimization pro uh, method like the genetic algorithm. So how the genetic algorithm works, so essentially it is still iteratively um, uh, uh, trying to find the models that can better feed the data. So in each iteration, we try to find a better model that can give a, a small update misfit. And, uh, and then we repeat these iterations uh, until the model converts, sorry, the inversion converges. Um, and so during the which the model is just changing all the time. And so inside each iteration, so what is happening, so this video can be used to show that. So in each of the uh, iterations, 
So we have a large number of populations. Uh, uh, we have a large number of models. Uh, so for these models, we call them GE populations. And we need to evaluate all these, uh, all their further responses. And then we need to calculate the data misfit of all these models. And then we need to rank all these models based on their data misfit. So once we get a, uh, the best model, then we can use the best model to reproduce the next generation, uh, essentially to, to generate another a large number of models for the next iteration. So we repeat this entire process just to get to, um, you know, to until the inversion uh, converges. So something else to consider um, is that uh, we probably need to think about it as a model subdivision. This is because uh, in our inversion, we try to keep the number uh, uh, of nodes small. Um, this is try to reduce the number of inversion parameters because that requires uh, uh, less computational resources. But obviously, when you have a small number of nodes, like the picture shown here, uh, we, we get a model like this, uh, which is not really realistic and which is not smooth. And uh, so we want to get something more realistic. So we can do that by subdividing our models uh, up to two times. And during the, uh, the subdivision, we also perform 3D interpolation just to, uh, uh, to uh, make the, uh, the, the models much smoother. We, we can do this to the uh, block type of parameterization, and we can also do this to the, uh, to the surface type of parameterization. Um, uh, another thing that we must need to deal with is 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 the intersection detection here. Uh, that is because you know uh, we allow the nodes to move basically freely within the uh, the model bounds, but that can cause problems because that can easily get your triangles intersecting with each other, like the picture shown here. So to solve that, we implemented a really robust algorithm just to make sure no models are having this triangle triangle intersections. So um, that's considered in our algorithm. Um, so there, here uh, I give you some more uh, detailed specifics about the um, inversion uh, compared with the uh, gra uh, uh, gravity or mag inversion. So for EM problems, you only you not only need to discretize the anomalous region, you but you also need to discretize the entire model just because you want to calculate for the responses. And also that means for um, for each of the models that you generate, you, you need to be able to automatically generate a mesh for that. Um, and, and then um, we use Tatagen to solve this problem. Uh, so to capture the further modeling responses, we I use the finite element solver. And uh, as, as I mentioned before, so all the models in the GE population, their evaluation uh, actually can be can happen uh, in parallel. So we implemented an MPI and OpenMP parallelization algorithm just to uh, speed things up. Um, okay, so now I'll give you two examples. The first is a very simple uh, uh, synthetic emergency SEM example. Uh, we have a real data set actually, but we haven't managed to uh, invert it. But here we use this uh, example to verify our algorithm. So what we have in this model is an ore deposit here. Uh, the shape is shown in this uh, picture. And uh, we consider uh, realistic bathymetry data as well. And we have two transmitters uh, on the sea floor, uh, TX1 and TX2. They are all extracted electrical uh, dipoles. And we have four profiles there. So. We consider uh, this uh, um, uh, ore deposit uh, being more conductive compared to uh, the seawater and also the sediments there. And we calculate the further responses. Uh, here, these pictures are showing the responses of the X component electric uh, field uh, for the first and the fourth um, profile. And um, okay, I see, I see a question. Um, um, I think I will go through uh, uh, the presentation first and before I answer the question. I hope that is okay. Um, so uh, I, I get back to the questions later. Uh, uh, sorry for that. And uh, okay, so we calculate the, the the further responses using our further, uh, further modeling of, uh, our codes, and this is what we get. And then we apply uh, Gaussian noise to get a, a synthetic observed data. So uh, these pictures show the uh, the uh, show the model setup here. So we use the green wireframes to show the true look uh, true shape of the model, and then uh, this red stuff inside this uh, uh, green wireframe 
or you can see it here. This is the actual input model. So what we are trying to invert for is the bottom part of the uh, of the or body because the top part is is known that it's just a basically constrained by the bathymetry. And then for um, for getting these. <clears throat> As for parameterizing uh, this bottom part, we use the 38 nodes, and uh, each node we allow it to only move vertically. Um, so this is the range uh, that it is allowed to move, and we use the uh, 238, uh, sorry, 239 models in the uh, in the GE population. So this is uh, this is actually a pretty large number because we need to evaluate all the further responses of these 239 models. And then this picture shows the uh, data fitting after the inversion converges. So as we can see, the solid line is, uh, uh, used, uh, is used to represent the predicted data. And the dashed line with error bars, these are the observed data obtained by adding uh, noises, Gaussian noises to the further model response. And we can see after the inversion converges, uh, I, I, I think um, these two data, data sets, they are uh, matching with each other pretty well. Um, within basically within the range of error bars. Um, so this is a, a convergence curve. We can see uh, even starting from the very first iteration, it's already having a really small data misfit. Uh, and it, I, I think it's um, converged after about 40 iterations. So the reason why uh, you we, we are seeing a really small data misfit here is just because <clears throat> it's just because we have a large number of uh, um, we have a large number of uh, uh, um, models in the GE population, and out of these 239 models, there's already one model that is able to, uh, to match the data very well. Um, uh, so that's the reason why you are seeing a very small data misfit. Uh, and also another reason is because we, we just assigned the true physical property values to the whole body and to the background. So this is a, essentially a, a kind of an easy problem to solve. Uh, and here um, are some information about the computational resources. We use 240 CPUs, and that means one CPU for each model. And actually, it just takes about a three, uh, sorry, 43 minutes to solve these uh, 40 iterations. So it's a kind of a, a fast uh, inversion, um, just because the EM problems, uh, CSEM problems, is a bit is a bit easier to solve, I guess. Um, and the <clears throat> And finally, let's see uh, uh, what I uh, constructed by uh, carrying out of this inversion. So on the right, this green model is, is used to show the constructed model from the inversion. And I think compared with the true model, we can see um, is, it, 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 you know, this constructed model is, is really matching with the true model very well. Um, so again, this is a static study and uh, this is a, uh, just used to verify our algorithm. And I think we obtained a good model here. Uh, so let's next, to, let's next move to a, a realistic uh, TEM example. So this is actually a real data example from a uranium exploration project in the Athabasca Basin. So on the left of this picture here, it shows the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the shape of the basin and the basin is located in the Northwestern part of the Saskatchewan province. And uh, this green, sheet, uh, green sheeted area is used to show the uh, Preston Lake project area. Um, and if we first take a look at the geological map here, so we can see uh, this is the geological map of the Athabasca Basin. And there are some known uh, mining sites represented by these uh, red stars and rectangles. We can see they are almost always controlled by these major fault lines in the basin. So that tells us, you know, these uh, uranium deposits they are closely related to the uh, to the graphitic faults in the basin. So the deposit actually are shown by this red pause here, and also here they are found to be close to the unconformity, and they are always found to be uh, clo uh, closely related to the graphitic fault. So because their size is pretty small, uh, um, and uh, um, for that reason, we can't really target them directly using any geophysical method anymore because now they are uh, generally buried under a few hundred meters of sandstone basin. So, but luckily we know because of the close relationship, we know we can target the graphitic fault instead. So, and we know that the sandstone basin and, and metamorphosed basement, they are all very resistive, but the graphite is conductive. And due to this nice physical property contrast, we can 
then use EM surveys to locate this graffiti fog first. And once we locate that, we can start drill, uh, uh, drilling it and see whether we have uranium deposits there. That's basically how it works. For, so for, 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 for me as a geophysicist, this is a, the graph, the graffiti fault is the only thing that I need to uh, I need to care about. Okay, so back in 2017, we have a few survey grades carried out in the area, um, and 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 uh, we are just focusing focusing on the north grid uh, in this presentation. So we can see there are six profiles in in the north grid, and uh, each profile has 61 stations. So this is a moving loop uh, uh, GM survey again, and uh, we. We, uh, we know that back in 2018, a year after, so we have uh, uh, six drill holes drilled there. So they are, are, uh, they are showed, shown by this purple diamond symbols there. And we can see the green line actually shows approximately, based on our understanding uh, of the data, approximately where are the, uh, uh, where is the graphitic thought. Um, so we have actually uh, both DBDT and B data because of the way that the survey was, con uh, was conducted. Uh, but we only uh, inverted the B-field data. Um, we only inverted the um, data from these two profiles. We did not uh, perform the inversion for the entire grade just because that is too computationally expensive uh, at this moment. And also because there are two drill holes, if you see here and here, they have shown to be, uh, to have all hit the uh, graphite fault there. So this is nice because we can use these to verify our inversion results later. <clears throat> so uh, before I carry out this surface geometry inversion, uh, I carried out a, a try and error modeling. And with that try and error modeling, I had a, a good estimation of the background connectivity model because the, the model is generally simple uh, for the background. And also I had a, a really um, um, a good estimation of where the conductors might be. So I was able to build this model. And uh, so I used 26 nodes, as you can see in this picture uh, with different colors, and I connected them into um, a 30, a 34 regions. So uh, I, applied it, uh, I applied different bonds, obviously, based on my understanding. Uh, so these bonds essentially are serving as uh, priors, actually, so based on my understanding. Um, and in this example, uh, another Another thing is that we also not only consider the inversion of uh, sorry, geometrical parameters, we also consider the inversion of physical properties inside the, the connector. So we can see that for each of the triangles, so uh, anything inside this triangle, um, they have uniform uh, physical properties, but outside, but in different triangles, their physical properties, which essentially is a connectivity, they are allowed to, 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 to change during the inversion. That's the way that the model is set up. And uh, I choose, um, so uh, in total, I have 69 uh, inversion parameters and I choose 599 as the population size. So I then carry out the inversion on 600 CPUs and uh, that essentially uh, means one CPU for each model. Uh, so after the inversion coverage, uh, I took a look at the data fitting for these two profiles. I think it's fair to see, uh, especially for this profile, the second profile, uh, things are really matching well, the predicted data which are shown uh, by these uh, uh, cross symbols and also the observed uh, shown by the solid lines, they are matching well with each other for three components and for different time channels. Um, but one thing in particular that we are not able to match is uh, actually this cross line component in this first profile. I, I thought at, the, at the first that this is because we are having a really large uh, noise level in this component and in this profile. Uh, but anyway, so this is uh, uh, the constructed model uh, from the C version. And uh, something, um, 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 so the colors inside the triangles, they are used to show the connectivities of the inversion. So different uh, uh, regions have different uh, connectivities. And also the wireframe, they are just used to show the, uh, the, the locations of the connector where the inversion thinks it is located at. And also there are two extra things we need to note uh, here and here. So they are actually the drilling data as colored by different colors. So these are essentially color bars, but different color are used to show different lithological units. And what you need to pay attention to is the red part here, which is pretty, pretty small just because of the small thickness of the graphic fault. But we can see at this region, at least our inversion, our construction model is able to match with red color. It's 
almost exactly intersecting the red color there, but not so much here in this area. But um, um, but for now, let's uh, take a look at the uh, convergence curve. So we see that we were able to reduce the data misfit from somewhere about 275 and to somewhere below 125 within 175 each regions. Um, so we are not obviously we are not able to um, to reduce um, the data misfit to to a target data misfit one just because the way that we are uh, we are parameterizing this thing uh, this connector we are only exploring the model space in a very localized space so that's the reason. Um, uh, so here is a short video showing how the model is changing. You can see at the very beginning the model is changing rapidly in you know larger range and this red dot here is actually showing. Uh, the data misfit of each of the iteration as the model as the uh, model is changing, and we can see towards the end, the only thing that is still rapidly changing is probably on the bottom parts of the nodes. So the top parts of the nodes they are not actually changing too much anymore. Um, but um, I, I guess that's just a, because it's already having a really good data, uh, match, and the top part of the model is really more important than the bottom part. And again, we can see. Here we are having a really good match uh, with the drilling data, but not so much at this region. And um, it's strange that uh, the red node here, if you can see, instead of having a smooth variation to this side, is popping out to the north. And that is just a, not something very realistic. So, um, so I, I thought, okay, since I already have the, uh, the drilling data are, uh, available to me, why not just the Carry out a constraint inversion, and it turns out it's really easy to do constraint inversion uh, in uh, this uh, algorithm. So, if you want to constrain uh, the model, then you just uh, uh, insert two extra nodes, the green nodes here, and exactly the location of the intersection. And then you would not allow these two nodes to move in any direction during the inversion, and you would only allow other nodes to move. That's the way how you, you constrain your inversion. So, this is much easier. Uh, to apply compared with the conventional memory structure immersion. And then um, because the, uh, the, the two extra nodes in, inserted here, and also I need to create a few extra triangles that ended up uh, giving me a slightly uh, larger number of parameters from 69 to 88, but I kept everything else the same. So the J population is still 599 and everything else is the same. So let's take a look at this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, constructing model. And I uh, and we can see that uh, because we have the constraints applied, obviously the the, the match in these two areas they are just perfect. They can't be anything else. But uh, uh, but everything else is pro probably different uh, with the previous inversion. So let's compare them later. But first, let's take a look at the um, the convergence curve. I think if you remember previously, we uh, we had an initial data misfit of two hundred seventy five, and it. Uh, it was only able to reduce to the same, basically the same level after 175 iterations. And here we are about doing this in just uh, eight, uh, sorry, 80 uh, iterations. That means probably just because of the, uh, the, the constraints applied. So we are uh, getting a much easier job to solve. Uh, so the uh, inversion converges uh, uh, faster now. So let's compare the constrained uh, and unconstrained merchant models. And we can see for the constrained model and unconstrained model, if you look at this top part of the, of the model, I think they have, uh, I'm sorry, they, they are you know, plotted using uh, slightly different perspectives. But if you look into detail, I think it's fair to see, you know, these top nodes, they have very similar patterns. This is probably just uh, telling us, you know, this is uh, what is required to match the data. Although you see, well, this is very different at the bottom. Um, just that I think just uh, easy to understand. This is just because the data don't really necessarily tell us a lot of information about the bottom parts. Um, but what's interesting is uh, this region, as I mentioned before, this is not really unrealistic uh, in the unconstrained word inversion, but here we are getting a more realistic inversion example. Um, um, and then we can see by comparing the data fitting for the first profile, we can see Probably we can um, um, we can see that uh, for this cross line component, we are getting a, a better match now, just because of the introduction of the constraints there in the inversion. Uh, and then afterwards, I was looking uh, at the data again, the, the data fitting 
profile by profile, and then realize something um, that I think I should investigate further. That is, we can see all the anomalies uh, of this single climatic in this uh, in this survey grid. They are just uh, concentrated in the center part of the profile, and all the uh, stations, all the data from the stations outside this uh, small window probably don't count re uh, really much. And also, when I was looking at the decay curves, uh, station by station, profile by profile, you can see for a station like the uh, like this one here, uh, which is close to the uh, to the end of the profile, all the three components, as we can see, their their uh, their magnitude is pretty small compared with another station which is here. So, I order at least the difference can be uh, found in this uh, in comparison. So, um. Uh, another thing I have also discovered during this comparison is, is, is that for a small response like this one shown here, they have probably already followed below the uh, the error, the sorry, the noise floor. And then the error bars, I realized that, that, that the data uncertainties I, uh, I assigned to all the data is probably not enough, not sufficient. So uh, before, um, I was calculating the data uncertainty by calculating the maximum value of a standard deviation and 2% of the data. The standard deviation was calculated from uh, three measurements because we had three measurements for each data point, and then I was able to calculate the standard deviation. That is no way a good, a good estimation of the true uncertainty, so I have to use a, a maximum value of these two. But it turns out probably 2% of the data is not enough. Then I updated the calculation method from using maximum uh, standard deviation of, uh, and 2% of the data, I now use 5% of the data. And also previously I did not consider a noise floor, but now I think I need to consider a noise floor just to make the, the inversion uh, behave better. And uh, we can see uh, the comparison of the same uh, station, um, um, of the same station uh, once uh, after I updated the, the uncertainty calculation, the error bars, if you look at these and these, the error bars from the bottom picture, they become larger, and which means the uncertainties have increased. So um, then I believe because of that, and also because of data decimation, when after I removed all the data, I was able to have a better match just by looking at this component, the cross line component of this particular st station. This is able to Match better. Anyways, so uh, let's take a look at the convergence curve of this updated inversion. Uh, again, I decimated the data remote uh, about two thirds of the uh, stations and also updated uh, the, the uncertainty. And then um, we can see instead of a, a having an initial data misfit of a 200 something, we are having a, this misfit of only 45. So, uh, and then this inversion uh, is able to reduce the uh, data misfit all the way to something close to 16, I guess, uh, after 140 iterations. Um, <clears throat> and this picture just shows the, um, uh, the updated inversion, the constructed model there. Uh, and I, I, you should note that this is actually not a constrained inversion. I just run the unconstrained inversion. We can see even without constraints, so this part of the model actually starts to uh, match the uh, drilling data there. Um, so I think this just tells us um, the 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 uncertainties that I used previously probably was not appropriate. Uh, and then this video uh, is also used to show how the model changes. Again, at the very beginning, you can see things are changing kind of rapidly in a large range. But as you go towards the end, uh, so similar behavior can be observed. So the nose, especially the top ones, they don't really change much anymore. Uh, and only the only thing changing is the bottom nose. And towards the end, the physical properties are changing uh, quite rapidly for this example. That's quite interesting, actually. Um, but but anyways, this is uh, uh, what I get from this updated inversion, and I think this is a this can be considered to be better than the previous inversion. Just looking at the constructed model, and also by looking at the data fitting, we can see um, for this second profile, it's always having a good match, so it's not really important there. What's important here, we can see for the cross line component, is starting to get a good fit finally. So this is uh, uh, the updated inversion. Uh, the last thing I want to mention in this presentation is uh, the MCMC sampling, um, which can be used to uh, to do the uncertainty quantification. I think um, uh, it's fair to see in recent years, especially uh, we uh, in the community have uh, uh, paid more attention to um, the model uncertainties because we all know that 
most of the geophysical uh, models, they are just wrong, but exactly how wrong are they? We, sh we should get a, a quantification of that. So um, this MCMC sampling uh, is actually a, a, a one um, important component in our algorithm. And I, I here I use it to uh, do a very simple study on a synthetic data. So again, I, I was using the moving loop uh, um, uh, DM survey. I considered three profiles, three, uh, three loops here, all the receivers here. And I considered a simple black model represented by this red block here. And the green model here is actually the model that I obtained from running the immersion, the surface geometry immersion. So this is the model I get. So you can see it's not really close to the true model, but that's kind of expected just because of the non-uniqueness of EM problems. And then I ran the MCMC sampling, a sample of the model for 73,000 iterations. And I was able to get some uh, statistical information here. Um, I think this picture is getting busier, so let's see this picture instead. So again, uh, I changed the color, sorry. Uh, so now the true model is represented by this uh, gray, uh, gray color here. So the green nose and, and the gray body is the true model. And the green model here is the initial model for the sampling or the constructing model for the inversion. We can see the gray model is built away from the true model here for every node, especially for this one. And then I, I, I did a sampling, uh, I sampled it for 78,000 times as I mentioned before. And then I was able to calculate the statistics of the sampling. So I realized the statistical information by using these ellipsoids. So these three dimensions, these sizes of the ellipsoids, they are used to show the standard deviation of all the sample models. So we can see one very obvious pattern is that we are having a really large uncertainty in the x direction, in the locations of the x direction of all these nodes. That is probably just because the moving loop um, TM survey does not really have good uh, uh, sensitivity to the uh, changes in the x direction, but instead it is really having good. Um, um, uh, sensitivity in the y direction and probably also in the z direction. And also, I think if you uh, just come, uh, uh, think about these four nodes uh, on the uh, on this uh, on this side, I think it's fair to see the bottom nodes. Uh, they are all having a larger answer compared with the top nodes. Not so much for these four nodes, but that's probably just because I haven't really sampled things enough. I, I, again, I only sampled um, them in seventy-eight thousand iterations. If I want to do a proper job, I should probably increase this number to one meeting. But that is just time consuming and I haven't really finished that uh, um, uh, so far. But, uh, but even for that, even, even with that, I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I still believe this MCMC sampling is something good that can be used to give us some uh, value, very valuable um, uh, uncertainty information about our inversion models. So finally to conclude, um, I think, we have uh, developed, uh, implemented a surface geometry inversion algorithm for EM data. And the algorithm works with both block T and thin plate-like anomalies. So we have tested our algorithm using both synthetic and real data examples. And uh, by just looking at this uh, real data example, I learned that the data uncertainties can really significantly affect the inversion results. And also for the moving loop TM survey, I think the cross-line component should not be overlooked. You should really pay attention to the to the component if you want to get a really a good accurate estimation of where is your model. Um, and also eventually uh, uh, we, we, we have seen that uh, MCMC sampling can be used for model answer and quantification. And that is just the one essential component in our inverter algorithm. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, NSERC and Orano Canada Inc. for providing financial support to this project in the past few years. And especially this uh, exploration team in uh, Orano Canada Inc., uh, Patrick, Grant, uh, Ramark, and LOD, they helped me a lot in the past years. Uh, 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 they give me a lot of support. And also, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Digital Research Alliance of Canada and also ACENET uh, for providing me with the, the computational resources. And uh, I'd like, also like to thank Dr. Jim Malone uh, for his input into the code. Uh, and also, most importantly, I'd like to thank our organizers of the annual. Uh, thank you, Alan, and thank you, Max, for organizing this. This is a wonderful opportunity for me. Thanks very much, and thanks for everyone to come. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That was very interesting, and 
I think that's reflected in the fact that there are already several questions um, about your presentation. So I'll start reading those and then I'll have a few sort of myself. And please, if you have other questions, um, please type them now and I, I will collect them. So the first question comes from Chao Jan Chen, actually. So hi, Xushan, thanks for the presentation. Can I ask, it actually has two questions about the EM forward model. The first one is that we can use the unstructured grid, say tetrahedron, to approximate the complicated model, which is better than the hexahedral grid. But how do those two different discretizations affect the EM responses on the observation side? So I suppose, yeah, tetrahedral versus hexahedral grid. Do you have any opinion on that, on you know, how well you can work with those? Um, yeah, I think um, uh, from our experience, past experience, I think when we really want to have a good representation of, of the geologic model, which have really complex ge geometric shape. So if you want to do uh, accurate enough modeling, you really <coughs> need to uh, represent the model uh, in terms of the geometry uh, correctly. And then um, I, I, we, our experience just shows that uh, Using extra tetrahedral grids is just a, a more convenient or more flexible that you can do a better job in terms of approximating the geometry there of the or bodies. But in terms of the numerical methods, I think uh, either should work uh, as long as you have a good uh, you, you have a good uh, uh, approximation of the uh, true geology uh, geological body there. I, I think they should do uh, they should both work. Yes, I mean, I'm not no specialist, but I appear to remember, okay, which one I think hexahedra are slightly uh, more convenient num computationally, numerically, once you have a good mesh, but uh, maybe the meshing is easier for the tetrahedra. Good. I mean, maybe a specialist on finite element methods can, can weigh in there. Okay, so the second one, this second one is about the condition number of the corresponding systems. Have you ever compared these two systems generate, generated by using tetrahedral and hexahedral elements separately? Is the system using the tetrahedral grid more ill-conditioned than the hexahedral grid? Oh, well, I think that is probably true. So um, from early works, uh, uh, you know, when people, most of people were using the rectilinear meshes, I think, it, um, you know, one simple fact is that people were still able to use uh, um, uh, uh, iterative solvers to solve this, I think. Um, but it's, it then become a really, um, it then became a more uh, difficult to solve once you use uh, uh, tetrahedron uh, discretization. So uh, mathematically, I think it's a more difficult job, um, problem to solve. But, but I mean, you know, um, I, I think even with the rectilinear mesh, now most people would use uh, direct solvers. I think uh, um, it's something that can be solved with direct solvers, even for the, uh, for the digital discretization uh, with the uh, tetrahedral meshes. Yeah, thank you. Um, then that we have an uh, anonymous question. Any differences between pixel inversion and parametric inversion when computing Jacobian matrices? Um, we are not computing Jacobian matrix anymore in our surface geometry inversion because we are just using uh, uh, the genetic algorithm to do the optimization. And so that uh, does not involve any Jacobian uh, matrix computation. Yes, uh, and I mean, from my understanding, there is a difference in the sense that, I mean, your Jacobian matrix, right, has dimensions, number of data times, number of model parameters. So your Jacobian for the system, it might be tricky to compute those derivatives, but it's definitely a lot smaller than for, for one of those big 3D inversions where you have like 100 by 100 by 100 pixels. That, that's true. It's really tricky to, come, to calculate if we, even, even if we wanted to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the second question, I'm not sure it's the same person. Can we invert both boundary points and conductivity resistivity in the parametric inversion? I suppose that was a question for, for the first part because I think then you answered that. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we could do that. Yeah, and you showed in the second part how you how you changing both the, the position of the, those mesh points and 
uh, and the resistivity values. Um, then, okay, this is in, I suppose, Chinese. Maybe you can read that name. Can you read the name? Uh, because I don't know. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, hi, Qushan. Thanks for the presentation. Can I ask a question? Um, what is the software used in your picture of a block in the half space? Um, I, I type in here, so uh, that is library called we do. Uh, it's Python package, basically uh, uh, leverage the VTK. Um, so it's, well, I don't know where it is now, but I type it again in the, in, in the chat box. Uh, yeah. So we, we do. We that's do. The, yeah, that's the, the, the library's name. Uh, Okay. Yeah, it's it's really nice package, and I like use it and I use it a lot actually. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, while people, my other people might um, type more questions, I have something. If you want to, a, a point, a point for discussion or some thoughts uh, about you were talking about your decimated data, yes. And in my experience, I agree completely that when you have these small data that might be low the noise floor, but might have unrealistic um, error bars, maybe two small error bars, yes, and it's really important to give them large error bars, which you, which you did. And if you don't do this, you can really hinder sort of converging to your, to your, um, to, to a good, good fit. And I think that's what you saw, right? I mean, the, the, now, the one thing, and I'm not sure, maybe this is also part of the question. I understood that you said, okay, to the side, things are, if you want to, a little bit boring. Yes, everything is, is constant. So did you actually then remove some of those data? Did you sort of do away the boring parts, if you want so? I actually just uh, excluded all the, uh, all the data from the side. So they were not included in the observed data in the version uh, at all. Um, so yeah, that's what I did actually. Okay, because I mean, I have this discussion with Alan sort of every once in a while because he also says, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you fit the boring parts and you know, you don't fit the anomaly because the, the, the misfit is as just an average of everything. So if you fit those boring parts really well because nothing happens, uh, then you get an RMS of you know, basically whatever you want without fitting that sort of anomaly, which um, tells you about what's actually going on. I mean, the only concern or counter argument I would have is, of course, the fact that nothing happens there tells you there is sort of a, a boring uh, background there. There's not much electrical structure. So it can certainly give you some, some information about the maximum extent that your anomaly has, because if, it, if you remove those parts, uh, then you, could, you might expand your ex anomaly, just make it a little bit bigger, um, and you don't see it because you, you remove the data. Do you have any opinion on that? Any thoughts? Um, you mean if I remove the, the, the boring part, then, um, you know, the, the anomaly can have, uh, you know, the, the, like the construction model in the inversion can actually have response, you know, that is not matching those boring parts of the model, uh, the data. Yeah, or in the sense that the, the fact that the data are boring and don't change tells you something about the Earth as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think essentially, I mean, if, uh, well, uh, this is a, uh, as you have seen, this is a computationally expensive problem. And uh, I think, I guess, part of the reason why I wanted to remove this the boring data is just uh, because I want to reduce the, uh, the, the computational cost there. And also, um, I, 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 I was afraid that, uh, you know, having this boring data, which, which has, which have a really small uh, amplitude there, might mean that I need to design carefully the error bars, you know, the errors assigned to this data. Otherwise, I might be fitting noise there. Yeah. Because you yeah. can see, as one of the, uh, the, the slides show, the, the, the cross-line component, especially in, in the boring part, they are pretty noisy, actually. So I was afraid that including them might just cause trouble there. Um, and yeah, I guess that's just my main concern. But but I, I don't know whether you know later I increase the 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 error size, the error bar size, the, the, the uncertainty would get rid of this problem. But I don't know. Um, 
So I guess, yeah, to, all, to, to, to really give a good answer to your question, I would need to, to, to do more research on these just to keep the data there and then update the error bar, see what happens. Yeah, and I mean, I mean that's also my experience. Yeah, it's a constant struggle between <laughs> keeping the right amount of data and keeping the important data and getting rid of these things that you think are not, not important and actually understanding that problem. Okay, in the meantime, we had another question. Michael Dunham. Hey, Xushan, uh, great presentation. I had one question for you. How does this SGI technique accommodate non-homogeneous backgrounds? In brackets, or can it? The marine example seemed like the background was homogeneous. I think your Alta Athabasca example had the overlying sediments in the basement layer. But I assume that depth locations are fixed. So do you have to assume there are no lateral variations within the fixed background layers? Um, that's a really good question, Michael. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, um, in our inversion, we try our best to not to consider all this background. Um, so that's the reason why for the last real data example, I carried out, uh, I first carried out the uh, try and error modeling just to get a background conductivity model there. So I used that background conductivity model. Um, I, I did it. I did not change them at all. Um, uh, and um, I, I think on the other hand, I think you know this is still something better than what is common common in practice in the industry, which just assumes the background to be entirely resistive, uh, infinite uh, resistivity there. So. Yeah, so this is something that our algorithm cannot really do much about it. So, like I said, I this is a probably a localized inversion. Uh, I, I, sometimes I would refer to that, um, but but still, this is some. This is still can, uh, you know this algorithm still can allow you if you want to get a really good uh, a background uh, model there. So one way to to solve that problem is that you can probably carry out a voxel inversion. And then you can extract a background model from that voxel inversion, and you only change uh, the localized uh, connector in your surface geometry inversion. That might solve the problem, but yeah, I guess uh, um, probably not entirely. Um, yeah, and I suppose it's, I mean, we discussed this a bit sort of before the talk, right? You, you have these trade offs between the, the smooth inversions where you get all these blurry blobs, yes, and but but maybe you can deal with the background better or something like this, where you get very local sort of high, I mean, and your MCMC and others showed this as well, yes, fairly well constrained in, uh, information about local structure, but then uh, maybe your background is, is a bit harder to deal with, right? And uh, yeah, <laughs> we unfortunately we can't have it all. No, yeah, that's 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 fair a statement. We can't have everything good good part of everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, to me, it seemed well. I'm certainly sort of had my questions answered, and it seems like there are no open questions anymore. So thank you very much again for for this talk. And I will hopefully see most of you again next week. Thanks, Max. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.